Do you know how to use a forceps, how to hold it, how to position it and how to do the luxations and the rotations properly? Choosing the right forceps is a topic of another video. To summarize, when it comes to the selection of the appropriate forceps, optimal adaptation of the beaks to the vestibular and oral surface of the tooth is essential, otherwise the grip won't be stable enough. The diverse anatomy of the teeth necessitates the availability of different types of forcepses with distinct beak designs. Ok, let's say you have chosen the right forceps, but do you know how to hold it? It's pointless to mention that the handles go in your palm and the fingers around the handles. During positioning of the forceps, one of your fingers should be on the inner surface of the handle. This way you can open and close the forceps easily. Now you know how to hold the forceps, but how to position it properly. The idea is to slide the beaks along the enamel surface and grasp the root. The beaks must be positioned on the rough cementum and not on the smooth enamel. This will prevent slippage of the forceps during luxation. Take your time to confirm that the tips of the beaks do not engage the soft tissues or the bone. The easiest way to achieve this is not to detach the beaks away from the tooth surface while inserting it in depth. When the beaks are under the gingiva, the forceps is forced with apical pressure so the beaks can grasp the root as apically as possible. This way, the point of rotation of the tooth is closer to the apex and the possibility of root fracture is reduced. Quick tip, some students are confused which way to hold the forceps, especially for posterior maxillary teeth. The beaks will always guide you. The beaks of the forceps must be parallel to the long axis of the tooth, otherwise the risk of fracture increases. If you think about it, the forceps with the tooth in its beaks creates a first class lever, which is at an angle. The long arm is the forceps with part of the tooth, the fulcrum is the bone, and the short arm is part of the root. Once the beaks are properly positioned, you should grasp the handles at their very end. Why is this? The longer the effort arm, the less force is needed. This means less resistance to your arm, which leads to better control. When you are sure that the beaks are at the correct position, only then you can grasp the handles of the forceps with all your fingers, ensuring a secure and controlled grip. Now you will ask me how strong should I squeeze? During luxation, it is crucial to establish a firm connection between the forceps and the tooth, or simply said, the tooth should not move in the forceps during luxations. The basic concept is this. The tooth, the forceps and the dentist's wrist should function as a single unit. Among these components, the tooth should be the only mobile element. The tooth should move only relative to the bone. If any of the components of this unit start moving independently from each other, this can lead to complications. Be patient. After you fracture a few teeth, you will get a feel of how much force is needed. With forceps can be performed luxational and rotational movements. You must understand that the idea behind luxation and rotation is to expand the alveolus and rupture the periodontal ligaments. During luxational movements, as we mentioned, your wrist should be locked and the arm held against the body. The force that you will apply must come from the shoulder and the upper arm and not from your wrist. Luxation movements are done in the direction that will allow the easiest deformation of the alveolar walls. Accordingly, the movement is almost always vestibular oral because the bone in this area is thin and allows easier deformation. The major portion of the force is directed toward the thinner alveolar wall because it deforms more easily. The fingers of your supporting hand are positioned vestibularly and orally to the tooth. Feel the deformation of the bone during luxation. Use this tactile feedback to guide you how much force is needed. A typical error I observe with many of my students is the following. While doing the luxation, the tooth becomes more and more mobile. 
as the tooth is already a bit mobile, they continue to luxate the tooth in the slightly expanded alveolus without increasing the amplitude of the luxation. Or simply put, they begin to wobble the tooth in the alveolus. The idea is, as the tooth becomes more and more mobile, to increase the amplitude of the luxations. Bone is hard but plastic and by applying continuous force you can deform it. Let's imagine that you're extracting upper premolar. Steady, slow, gradually increasing force in the vestibular direction will deform the bone much more effectively than a series of rapid, jerky, small movements. The pressure you apply should be held for several seconds to give the bone time to expand. Subsequently, palatal luxation should be done. You will encounter resistance indicating the contact between the root and the palatal wall of the alveolus. At this point, a slight deliberate increase in the force of luxation should be exerted to create a controlled expansion of the alveolus. This sequential approach of palatal and vestibular luxations will allow for a controlled expansion of the alveolus. The aim is to expand the socket gradually, minimizing the trauma to the surrounding structures. What about rotational movements? The idea behind this approach of extraction is to expand the alveolus and overstretch the periodontal ligaments to the point of their rupture. Rotation can be performed on single rooted teeth with straight, conical, ovale roots which are not curved. The tooth is turned slowly around its long axis until the beaks are almost in contact with the adjacent teeth. The moment the fibers are torn, you will feel how the tooth becomes loose in the alveolus. During the luxation and especially during the traction, it's crucial to coordinate the movement of the forceps with the shape of the tooth roots. You have to feel the direction in which the tooth naturally emerges from the socket with the least amount of resistance. So, if the root of the upper premolar is with distal curve, the traction should be outward, upward and distal. Ok, let's recap. Why is it important to position the beaks on the cementum rather than the enamel? What is the ideal way to hold the handles of the forceps during luxation? What is the position of the beaks according to the tooth? Why is it important to increase the amplitude of the luxation as the tooth becomes more and more mobile in the alveolus? This video provides a concise summary of the knowledge on this topic derived from the referred sources transformed through my clinical experience. If you find it valuable, hit the like button, subscribe and drop your questions in the comments below. You can join our mission by contributing on Patreon. Only together we can revolutionize dental education.